minute talk by Eric Evanson. Eric is currently the Director of Computational Sciences at Nodality, and he's going to talk to us today about fighting cancer with Python. Let's give him a warm welcome. All right, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Good. Uh, so good afternoon. I'm really honored and humbled to be here. So thank you for the thank you to the organizers for this opportunity um, to speak with you and, and share some of the work that we're doing at Nodality um, with the the goal of fighting cancer using tools that we've built using Python. Um, I've actually been wanting to give this talk uh, since I heard about and watched Steve Yeagy's OSCon talk in 2011, where he talked about not wanting to work on cat pictures and starting to work on uh, important problems. So I think cancer is a pretty important problem. Um, this statistic is showing that for people who were cancer-free in 2006, among men there is a 50% chance that you'll develop cancer, some, some sort of cancer sometime in your life. And in women it's a one in three chance. So cancer is really going to touch all of our lives. Um, very poignantly, cancer touched the Python community last year with the tragic and very early passing of John Hunter, the, uh, the author of Matplotlib. And we use Matplotlib a lot at Nodality, so we, you know, we sort of felt a, a strong connection to this. Uh, I wanted to take a second to introduce myself and tell you um, about what I hope you will get from this talk. So I've been knocking about with computers since like the late 70s early 80s. You know, I'm one of those guys that Eben talked about this morning who got the Apple II and had to you know, learn how to program on it and things like that, and I wanted to build my own games instead of playing games. Um, in high school, I got introduced to biology and really fell in love with science. Uh, and so I pursued a, a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a PhD in biophysics. Uh, since I finished my academic career, um, I've been working in the biotech and pharma industries for about 13 years, um, where I've been working on developing models to help discover drugs and translate biological sciences from the bench to the bedside. And I've been using Python uh, doing this, so I've been a Python uh, developer and user for about 13 years. Um, what I hope you'll get from this talk, for the non-biologists in the room, um, I hope to give you a, a glimpse into life sciences problems and how Python is connected to these problems and enables us to work on these critical areas. Um, for any biologists who might be joining us, uh, hopefully you'll see some examples of how we've assembled various Python libraries to support the workflows um, in our research. And I'm going to do this by showing you some vignettes of workflows. Um, Unfortunately, because of time, I had, I had some code samples in here, but I just had to take them out. Um, but I still hope that you'll find out about some packages you didn't know about or get some ideas about how we've integrated these things um, to build a robust informatics, data science, and visualization platform. I promise not to show any equations. So a little bit about where I'm working right now. I work at this uh, local company, Nodality. We're located up in South San Francisco, which is just up the 101 from here. Uh, the company started in about 2006 based on technology that was invented in Gary Nolan's lab at Stanford. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the technology to set the stage for the sort of data that we work on. But the, the underlying goal of the company is to develop deep knowledge about disease biology and then leverage this knowledge to improve patient outcomes. So that's something that's very core to what we do, is thinking about the patient and what it means to the patient. And really thinking about what we develop, is this something that we would trust to have our grandmother take? and to inform their her treatment decisions. Um, the, no the nodality technology is very widely um, applicable, and we've been working mostly in the areas of oncology, which is the study of cancer and autoimmunity. Uh, so this is our group at Nodality, and you will probably see a few of these characters around the conference. I know some of them are in the audience here. Um, I'm really hoping there's not going to be any heckling from them. Uh, if you're interested in any, knowing any more about what we do, since I really can only give you a little snapshot and glimpse into it, feel free to stop us and talk with us um, after the talk or any time at PyCon. Um, and we do have the mystery man here, so if you know, we find someone who's a good fit, we might be growing our group. So now I want to set the stage by providing a little bit of background on the war on cancer. Um, so the war on cancer has been going on for, or going on as if you can actually fight something like a disease, um, for over 40 years. It was initiated in 1971 uh, by Richard Nixon signing the uh, National Cancer Act. 
Uh, the, one of the goals of this, or one of the primary goals of this, was to connect more closely the National Cancer Institute with the White House and policy. And a lot of other people had very high expectations. There were things that I've read where people thought, oh, in 20 years we'll cut the cancer death rate in half. Um, now, we've made significant progress in understanding cancer biology um, and improving treatment regimens, but there's still a lot of um, opportunities for improving on this. So this graph here is taken from a New York Times article where they compare the decline in the heart rate, uh, I'm sorry, the, the heart, the disease, I'm sorry, the death rate from heart disease with the decline in the death rate from cancer. And you can see heart disease death rate has been declining steadily um, for the last 50 years, and this is largely because of awareness um, and improvement of uh, the pharmaceuticals that are available, such as Lipitor. We see in this graph that the cancer deaths are just starting to decline, and we'd really like to keep this trajectory and accelerate it, if at all possible. So the theme of this is that we need to connect a lot of the very elegant science, basic science that's being done, to the patient. Now I want to take a little bit of an aside and shift gears to talk briefly about data science, because this is how we're going to connect to the computational stuff. Um, so this is a, a subject that's very dear to my heart, and it's what I do almost every day. Um, and I've, I've borrowed the, the idea for this, this Venn diagram from Drew Conway's blog, where he defined data science uh, you know, in something that's very much aligned with the way I think about it. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary practice. And the goal is to extract insight from the data. And based on that insight, we want to discover things and build our knowledge base. So we see that we're talking about domain knowledge. And when we move into the domain of biology and clinical facts, data science essentially becomes computational biology. So to set the context for the data, I want to do a bit of a refresher on, on biology. Um, just to put into context how we're going to understand the disease. So the central dogma of biology says we have our genomic information, the instructions for life, essentially, encoded in DNA, which is transcribed and ultimately translated into proteins, which carry out these instructions. So to put this in the context of Python, you might think of the DNA as being our source code and the proteins as being our byte code. Now, it might be pretty easy to understand this if we had one or two genes that we had to understand how they um, go from the instruction set to the program. But recent estimates have, have put it at about 25,000 genes in our genome, and these encode for actually 90,000 proteins through some complexities and subtleties of biology. So that's a lot of stuff to get your head around. Now, to add to the complexity, these proteins, these 90,000 proteins, don't all exist in isolation and do their own thing. They're actually interrelated. They interact with each other. And to make it even more complicated than that, these protein interaction networks interact with other networks. So we have networks interacting with networks and a very high dimensionality um, in our data. Now, you might look at that and say, hey, I've seen something like that. These biological networks resemble social networks. And that's true. Um, you know, we use a lot of graph theory and things like that. So a lot of the tools or algorithms that have been developed for social network analysis are applicable to biological networks and vice versa. So things that we've, uh, methods we've developed for understanding biological networks also translate to social networks. So we've gone from the central dogma to these 90,000 some proteins that are interacting with, uh, with each other in various ways. And we can think about this as saying the connections or relationships between these proteins define and drive biology. And if you look at it that way, you, you can think of disease as essentially altered protein relationships, so some non-canonical relationships between the proteins. And so to understand disease, we're going to understand those relationships. And ultimately, we want to translate this to patient care. So from my bias, we're going to need a lot of data to understand this question. So now I want to talk a bit about how we generate this data. There are a lot of uh, ways to access biological data at various levels of detail. Um, 
and we go from sequencing or, or um, PCR methods for accessing information about DNA content to RNA for expression um, and ultimately the proteins and their functions. And what we're trying to do at Nodality is go all the way to the end here where we're looking at how these proteins interact functionally in their pathways. So the technology we've developed is called single cell network profiling, and I'll refer to that as SCNP through the remainder of the talk. So I want to tell you a little bit about how the SCNP assay works so we start to get an appreciation for what the data is and what we're trying to handle and mine. So we start with samples from patients or healthy donors. We usually work um, in blood or bone marrow samples. And then in a high throughput fashion, we do this on robots, um, we modulate or perturb or stimulate these cells from the patients um, with a variety of things, agents that are relevant to disease biology. So these may be drugs or growth factors or hormones or things like that. And then uh, concretely what we do in the assay is we let this uh, perturbation propagate for a little while and then chemically we freeze it. And then we come in and label the various proteins within the cell with antibodies that specifically attach to those proteins. And these antibodies are labeled with dyes that fluoresce in very specific wavelengths when we excite them with lasers. So now we have a way to read out the relative abundance of various proteins and how they've changed in the assay. So the last step is to measure what biology happened. What did we do in those uh, 96 well plates? And we do this on an instrument called a flow cytometer, where we're able to acquire data for every single cell that we ran the assay on. And that's really powerful. That's part of where we get the name single cell network profiling. So I want to talk a little bit concretely about what kind of data we're generating. We measure the change in protein activation or expression in response to various external stimuli. And what this does is reveal the signaling potential in every patient. And I'm gonna use the word signal a lot throughout this talk because that's our, uh, uh, how we think about how cells respond in the experiment. Now beyond that, looking at the relations among these signaling potentials tell us how the patient's cells are wired, and that should be connected to patient outcome. So if you thought about it and you, you say, came to a, a circuit board or something that you didn't really know about, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I might get this analogy wrong, um, what you might do is start thinking about changing some settings, twiddling some knobs, turning it on, injecting some signal, and seeing what happens. And that's more or less what we're doing with these cells. We're poking them and seeing how they respond. Now we generate this data on multiple levels that includes facts about the patients, um, facts about the various different kinds of cells that occur in the human body, and then uh, things about specific proteins and even the time points. So what is the time that it takes a signal to propagate through the system? So this leads to an important software requirement. We need to be able to track all of these relationships and be able to put them back together so that we can analyze the data and draw our insights. So concretely, I'm not gonna go through the math here, but we are generating on the order of a billion data points per experiment. Now that's a lot of data, right? So now we gotta think about how we turn that into knowledge and insight and ultimately connect it to the patient. So we have a way to generate rich biological data, and we have a conceptual framework for analyzing it, and I want to talk about how we're going to do this. Um, depending upon the disease setting or the clinical question that we're addressing, we can run all sorts of different kinds of experiments, and they have different requirements, and they generate um, a variety of data that has different kinds of dimensions and levels of detail. And we need to support all of this in our software and in our workflows. So this is a really important requirement. Uh, it boils down to we need flexibility and we need agility to carry out these experiments. And Python is highly enabling and a great fit for this consideration. So I'm going to talk in... in three basic or rough areas of the work that we do. So we generally think of this as computational science, um, but in this view, and there are a lot of different ways to think about it, I'm gonna break it down into informatics, which roughly talks about enabling workflows in the lab and managing the data that comes out of the experiments. I'll talk about data science, which is how we derive knowledge and insight from the data. 
And finally, visualization, uh, referring to how we communicate these insights. Now, mapping Python onto this way of looking at computational sciences, we see that Python is everywhere at nodality. And we've built up a toolkit which integrates a lot of these libraries um, into an analysis pipeline. Uh, we started out with essentially expert users who assembled things into command line scripts and programs that way. And more recently, we've been tying all this together into web applications and desktop applications for our, our wet lab users and clinicians. Um, I can't go into a whole lot of detail on anything in this talk, but we do have a couple of posters in the poster session. So the first one I want to plug is poster number 18. So let's talk about informatics. It's really about supporting workflows and managing data. Uh, and since, as I said at the beginning, what we want to think about is, would I be comfortable having my mother or my grandmother use this test to make decisions about her treatment? Data integrity and accuracy and consistency are paramount to what we do. And we have a lot of very complicated relationships there. So the first thing I want to show you is uh, about enabling the experimental workflows. So because these are big experiments, we rely on liquid handling robotics to carry out a lot of the putting cells in the right place, putting the right uh, reagents in, and moving stuff around. Now, every time the guys in the lab explain this to me, it makes me think of air traffic control. And we have to program the robot to take care of our air traffic control. Uh, and this is a really time-consuming exercise. So programming the robot can be uh, on the order of hundreds of people hours to set up for one of our big experiments. So what we've developed is a web-based framework um, to help generate the inputs for the robot. Now, one thing that I didn't talk about is we have a desktop system, a desktop software system, that helps the biologists set up their experiments. And we capture all of the data about their experimental design um, in a database. Uh, in this case, this is a bit of a legacy system, so it was written in .NET, and we store the data in SQL Server. Um, but for this application, we've wrapped the SQL Server legacy database in SQL Alchemy, which is very cool. Um, so concretely, the user comes in, hits the site on their, in their browser. We run Django inside Microsoft IIS, and this allows us to uh, conform to some of the security and access control requirements and nice things like single sign-on and Active Directory integration. Um, and then we query our experimental design database, get back that information, and use the XLWT library to write out Excel files, which are ultimately downloaded by the user through their browser and used to uh, operate the robot. So this software support for programming the liquid handling robot has literally saved hundreds of person hours and let us move on to things like generating more data more quickly or working on things that require real thought instead of the uh, sort of mechanical, where does the, next, where does the arm for the robot go next? So the next informatics topic I wanted to, to present is about ensuring reliable data. So we want to develop reliable classifiers, which means we need data that we trust to start with. You know, we can start with garbage in and we'll get garbage out, right? Um, so there are a few things we do here. We record the performance of the assay across time in our databases. So we look at the output from the instrument and the output from biological controls, which are well-characterized cell lines. We, we store this all in a database and we can look at this longitudinally and track where the instrument may be not performing uh, to the specification we need and where the biology may not be happening the way we expect it to, which could mean um, some sort of glitch in the processing or a clog in fluidics or something like that. Um, we've integrated all of this into a set of visualization and reporting tools that we've built using pandas, numplot, NumPy, Matplotlib, XLWT, and also expose this through the Tableau um, business intelligence program so the users can have interactive graphical analysis at their desks. Um, this, uh, this process also talks to our experimental design database, um, in this case through a SUDS library for Python, which consumes a SOAP service um, exposing some aspects of the experimental design. Um, one of the benefits of this end-to-end -end control over the experiment and the data is that we don't face some of the data cleaning issues that I've heard some people at PyCon talking about when you're talking about um, data analysis workflows. So then the next thing I wanted to cover is data science and how we connect all this data to patients. 
we might ask a, the, a question about what's different between two groups of individuals. This might be healthy donors versus patients or therapy responders versus non-responders. And the first step is to look at univariate or single signaling node differences between the patients. We might look for differences in signaling between various cell types. So what I've plotted here in box plots is two different kinds of cells and compared the signaling readouts um, between healthy donors and patients. And we see cell-specific responses. We see differences in signaling between healthy donors and patients with disease. And we see ranges or different variants in the signaling. So they may have similar magnitudes, but a larger range in variants in disease patients. And this would, might be telling us that some of their biological pathways are dysregulated um, or something is not right about them. Now, we generate a lot of data, and it's not always efficient to go through all of this stuff visually. So we could also do this numerically. Um, and we do this um, with support from the SciPy libraries, and we can also do it in R. So uh, equivalent to some of the examples I showed you before, we can search for differences in signaling using the t-test um, in either SciPy stats or uh, R through RPy2. Or we can look for the variant, the differences in variants. Um, when we look for these differences, since we're doing a lot of tests, we should, be te we should be correcting for multiple testing. And we do that with permutation methods or false discovery control methods um, in our exploratory work. And then with uh, statistical analysis plans and gatekeeper strategies for our uh, clinical validations. OK, I lied. There is an equation on here. Um, but I want to talk about really briefly about how we go from the patient's question to models. And we've built a machine learning framework in Python which leverages, I, I seem a little bit repetitive here, but pandas, numpy, scipy2, matplotlib, uh, rpy2. Um, and we've tried to combine our clinical intuition with feature selection methods and then apply a large number of standard modeling and machine learning techniques. Um, for example, regression methods, principal components analyses, um, tree-based methods such as random forests. Uh, we're not actually trying to innovate in machine learning, but rather have innovated applications of established methods. And we've built an in-house framework for doing this. Um, we've standardized on Panda data frames for many things. Uh, we, we really like Pandas. We actually had a couple of efforts to develop um, our own data frame object, and, and there's a lot of implementation details. And in our opinion, Pandas gets a lot of this right, so a big thank you to Wes McKinney. Um, so the last thing I wanted to cover is uh, visualization. So a professor that I had, I worked with in graduate school always told me it's not science until you tell someone else about it. And one of the best ways to tell someone else about it is visually. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you might have seen one of Hans Rosling's TED Talks. I think it's a great inspiration for how you can extract insight and communicate that insight using interactive visualization. And we're starting to realize this, this sort of vision at Nodality. And we've built up a web framework where users can drill down from a high-level information information such as a heat map showing the correlations between what happens to various proteins in our assay to the individual pieces of data uh, supporting those correlations and ultimately down to the, the data for every single cell that goes into that. Um, concretely, we've built this using Django to integrate a lot of our pre-existing stack and expose that out to the web browser um, using some JavaScript technologies. And we have a poster on this also. So this is poster uh, 29. Uh, so please come by and see us for those. Um, behind all of this, we have soft, strong software engineering practices, um, revision control, bug tracking, automated unit and regression testing. So it's a little bit interesting. I read some of the Hacker News responses to Steve Yeagy's talk, and the, the, the bioinformatics came in and saying, well, OK, where are bioinformaticists came in and said, where are the examples of good software engineering in bioinformatics? And a lot of people bemoaned the lack of good software engineering practices in our field. And uh, this is something that we take very seriously, because ultimately, we develop software that will be used in clinical tests. Um, not all software needs to go to that level of detail. Um, but we do support these things with strong validation plans. Um, and allegorically, we use uh, Py2exe to freeze our code. Um, and I can get into some more details of that offline, but generally our auditors have been satisfied with the way we describe that.
So some take-home messages. Um, in informatics, we really like using object relational mappers. Um, we found that it abstracts away a lot of the details of dealing with the database, and we don't take a great performance hit on it. And it really lets us think more about how we work with the data and what it means than the details of how do I get it back from the database. Um, in data science, the Python libraries are growing fast. I mean, I've really seen them expand across my career. Um, but they haven't quite reached the breadth of what, we can, what R has, so we depend heavily on RPy2. Um, in visualization, we like Matplotlib because we like to, to program in Python versus R. And for the web apps, Django has been very helpful for us. Um, and Python makes this possible. Um, Python has really grown up, as I've said. We love the batteries included, the rich ecosystem, so thank you for all the developers out there. Um, and then, you know, one of the take-homes is that Python supports almost all of our use cases, from low-level file parsing um, all the way up through building command line desktop and, and web apps. So I just wanted to close with two points. Um, the first is, we we're talking about the war on cancer. And I wanted to share with you that Nodality has actually won some small victories in small battles against cancer. Um, and the first case shown on the left here is in pediatric AML. So we work generally in blood cancers or leukemias. Um, and the question here is to predict which patients will respond to the standard therapy that patients are usually given when they're diagnosed. And this is important because AML being an acute disease, the time to treatment is of the essence. So you want patients to make the right decision and move on to the treatment that will Im um, have a greater chance of helping them. Um, in CLL, it's a chronic disease. The question for the patient is when do I need to be treated? And there are some clinical trials showing that potentially early treatment can help. So the last thing I wanted to do was thank you and return to sort of my inspiration for this talk, which was Steve Yege's talk on working, important, working on important problems, and say that we are using data science to improve patients' lives and translating the significant advances in cancer biology to things that are actionable for the patient using Python. And this arrow at the bottom here where I put the cancer death rate dropping is where we're going. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. That was good stuff. If we have any questions, we've got about three minutes. We've got a mic over here. If you've got a question, we'd like you to go over to the microphones where everyone can hear. Hi, thank you. Oh, is it, can you hear me? Um, so back at the beginning, you had a uh, Venn diagram, and there was a danger zone on it. And I was yes. really curious, because I'm afraid I might be in the danger zone. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Oh, uh, I just wanted to know more about the danger zone and make sure I'm not in it. OK. Um, so the question is, what is the danger zone in the Venn diagram about data science? Uh, and let me see if I can go back to that slide. So the danger zone is, um, and I guess it's a little hard to know when you're in it. So the danger zone is having a little bit of programming knowledge and a little bit of domain knowledge and not having the, um, the foundation in the math and statistics. So you might find some things that you think are really exciting, and if you don't think about them from what does that mean in the data and test those hypotheses carefully, you might go off in an area that um, is maybe non-productive or reach some conclusions that uh, may be embarrassing. I don't know. So it's, it's really about, you know, we need to have a solid foundation in all of these things to practice good data science. Hi. Uh, my question was more about the uh, assay. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to looking at blood, you have some highly abundant proteins in blood. What happens if the interesting change is in the very small proteins or very low abundant proteins? How well are those captured? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and it's a question that's um, important, uh, particularly for techniques like mass spectrometry. Um, I left out a lot of detail, so we do a lot of isolation steps. So we're really looking at um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So a lot of the abundant proteins have been, rem you know, like hemoglobin and things like that, um, have been removed. Got it. Okay. Anyone else? We've got time for about one more question.
So I'm kind of in your space where I'm working with a bunch of biologists. I'm sort of the programmer Python person. They are very resistant to programming in any shapes and form. Biology is the world of the Excel spreadsheet. Yes. How <laughs> do you fight that? We don't fight it. Um, one of the things about our company is that we believe one of our major products is knowledge and insight. So it's sort of in the DNA of the company that we do data science. Um, and we don't fight that by working with the biologists. We produce Excel spreadsheets for them. We listen to what they're asking for, what they want to see in the spreadsheet, and partner with them to produce the kind of analysis they want. And, and that's one thing we can do to keep things out of the danger zone. Uh, you know, it's very typical for me to say, hey, I've done this analysis. I go to one of my biology or clinical colleagues and say, this is what I think I saw. Does it make sense based on what you know? So by partnering with them, um, they don't go off and doing all sorts of analyses that may not be supportable, um, and I don't go off and doing all sorts of analyses that aren't relevant. Um, but I do have a phrase I use with them a lot. You know, one of the biologists that I work with, um, I tell him, I need to curb your optimism here. So he thinks he's found something in Excel, and then I have to put on all the statistical caveats. Uh, so it's, I think it's, it's kind of a people thing. You'll, you develop a good relationship with them, um, and it's, it's very productive. It, it really hasn't been much of a problem for us. All right, thank you very much, Eric. Let's give him a good round of applause.